Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, What's New in Kubernetes 1.19. I'm Jerry Fallon and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenters today. Nabrun Pal, Infrastructure Engineer at ClearSites. Taylor Dozal, Senior Developer Advocate at HashiCorp. Max Gorbachar, Manager of Cloud Native Engineering at StormReply. Just a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please put your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Please note that this is also an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later, to the, later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. And with that, I'll hand it over to our presenters for today's webinar. Thank you very much, Gary. So welcome to this webinar about the Kubernetes 119 release. I'm Max, um, I'm the Kubernetes 119 communications lead and um, will be the moderator for today's session. With me, we have Taylor. And we have uh, Navaroon. Um, both were like the, the key figures to, to move the release. Taylor is the release lead and Navaroon is the enhancement lead. So um, for today's agenda, uh, we're first looking on the 120 um, release, what's coming up there. Um, we're moving on to the 119 stats, going over to the 119 highlights, like how we came to this awesome great name of the Kubernetes 119 release, but also um, what are maybe some really interesting changes on what is new um, to the Kubernetes. Then finally, we move on to all the different updates through the different six. And in the end, we will dis discuss a few of your questions and hope we will also find some answers for it. Please remind that you can anytime ask us questions. I will try to answer some of them during the session. And um, if we have some which we really like to discuss or need some broader discussions, we will move them to the end to um, give you also some further insights. With that said, please go ahead. Sure, so I am going to go ahead and cover some of the 120 release dates that we have coming up. Uh, uh, Jeremy is leading the 120 release, Jeremy Ricard, and, uh, and just spoke with him yesterday. Uh, we talked a little bit about 1.20 will likely be the last release of 2020, unless uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't anticipate any more uh, jumping in there and surprising anyone. Um, uh, they're working on defining a test freeze uh, I believe last week chatted, there's a PR going in for that. Um, the release is targeted for Tuesday, December 8th. Uh, the enhancements freeze is Tuesday, October 6th. And all of the uh, shadows for that release have been onboarded. So that did kick off on September 14th. And then uh, the original target date was for the 8th of December. But uh, that's, uh, so still, still looking at like that uh, uh, is going to be the release date, but uh, uh, happy to have you all here today and uh, really excited to cover what came out in 119 and answer all your questions on that. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Navarun, who is going to kick us off with enhancements. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'll give you a brief overview of what enhancements uh, did we uh, ship out in the last uh, release. Uh, so we shipped out a total of 34 enhancements in 1.19. So by enhancements, we mean uh, features in Kubernetes. So they are they can be like API changes, they can be like uh, usability fixes, they can be uh, internet test changes, they can be conformance changes. Uh, so we usually categorize uh, changes or enhancements or features into three broad categories, uh, alpha, beta, and stable. So we had like 10 stable enhancements. What this means is there is like, nearly 100% confidence that these features are here to stay, barring some changes. Uh, they may be like improved, uh, but not substantially, which would affect the users. Uh, we have 15 enhancements graduating to beta in 1.19. Uh, 
So beta uh, stage usually uh, features tag in when they feel that they are confident enough that this may go to stable uh, or uh, generally available in the next few releases. So the API remains more or less constant between beta and stable changes. Uh, and then we have like nine alpha features. They are uh, like majorly new features into uh, the Kubernetes project. Uh, there may be new feature additions, which we will go through later on uh, when we do the SIG updates. Uh, with that, uh, I would hand over to Taylor again uh, for some highlights uh, on the 1.19 release. Ah, thank you so much, Navarun. So with uh, 119, the release name uh, that was chosen for this is Accentuate the Positive. Uh, I have to give a huge shout out to Hanabeth Lagalov for designing this logo and truly capturing what it felt like to be on the release team during this time. Uh, we faced a lot of uncertainty, which you know I'm sure you've heard that word numerous times uh, over the course of this year, but uh, it's, it was uh, really true. Uh, we started the 119 release uh, in one world and ended it in a completely different one. Um, it was also quite a marathon release, uh, and I believe it was the longest release that we've had to date, um, and really just wanted to focus on the community. That's why it got stretched out so long. Uh, we wanted to give time so that people were able to uh, really work through the, their enhancement proposals and features and uh, really focus on the community, right? Because if we don't have the community uh, working and behind us and, and we're working well with each other and communicating, we don't really have an open source project. Um, that's, you know, it's the community makes the project, not the other way around. And so really uh, was happy to see everyone in good spirits while working on this project and uh, while being sensitive to all that was going on around the world. But uh, so within this logo, you can see uh, there's some fun little Easter eggs. Uh, if you look close enough, you can see, you know, the Kubernetes logo and, and hat and uh, all of these, uh, you know, hints at things that might have come out during the uh, 119 release that a lot of people enjoyed and found fun. And then I'm pretty sure, I haven't uh, asked these characters here, but I'm pretty sure they're using a green screen because uh, uh, I don't think I've ever seen that uh, part of the beach just yet. But uh, <laughs> I'll have to ask them later. So in terms of new things, we are going to cover uh, each of the features individually, but just at a glance, um, some new things are structured logging, which I'm quite excited about. Uh, so looking at you know JSON logging or just standard out and standard error, that's going to make it a lot easier for ingest and you don't have to do any uh, wild regex rules or anything like that on that front uh, anymore as of 119. So very excited about that. Uh, storage pools for capacity management. Storage got a big uplift in 119, and there are a lot of new rules around how to deal with storage. It's not treated as just, you know, nebulous storage that's infinite. There are ways to atomically control how that is used and utilized within Kubernetes 119. So uh, again, we'll talk more to that, but that's also something I'm quite excited about. Uh, allow users to set a pod's host name to its FQDN. This will help with getting some legacy systems or uh, other things, you know, kind of that need that FQDN uh, to transition over. So if you have uh, a service that was called Foo, uh, you can get a whole qualified uh, domain name. And when you set that and you call that within the pod itself, rather than just getting the service name. Uh, allow CSI drivers to opt in to volume ownership change. That again is uh, uh, a storage interface improvement kind of within that same vein of being able to um, have a little bit more control over storage and, and how that's defined. Uh, and then same thing with uh, generic inline volumes. But again, we'll cover more of that as we uh, proceed forward. 119 marks a brand new support model for us as well. Uh, previous releases were only supported for nine months, which worked really well with the, you know, it was uh, one release uh, uh, or two releases back, um, uh, uh, just kind of supporting that, that three release cycle. So at any given point in time, we were working on a release, we have one out and then there's one behind. And so this is the first time that we are moving to that one year support. And uh, this is, you know, in reaction to a lot of the what the community has expressed, 
Um, at some organizations, it's much more difficult to, even though you have a year, it's difficult to uplift a lot of these workloads and get them ready for the next version or N plus, you know, versions of Kubernetes. And, uh, you know, we, we heard that and wanted to react on that front. So uh, very excited to announce, you know, with 119, we're going to have that year of support to allow people a little bit more time to shift their workloads over and uh, dealing with things like, uh, you know, the deprecations in 116 and other things of that note, you know, ho again, hoping that this makes things easier for, for most teams. With that, uh, let's jump into the SIG updates. And for to kick us off, I'm going to turn it back over to Nabrun. Thank you, Taylor, for uh, all the highlights from 1.19. That was really awesome. Uh, so I'll go through all the SIG updates. Uh, basically, uh, we have categorized all the enhancements into SIGs. Uh, so when when any Kubernetes feature is added uh, to to a release. Uh, it has to be driven by a group of uh, people. So the Kubernetes community is uh, structured into uh, logical isolations of uh, groups called special interest groups who actually own code in particular areas. And that's why we are doing it like uh, SIG by SIG. And the first SIG to come is API machinery. Uh, so let's uh, jump ahead and see what API machinery shipped in in 1.19. Uh, the first feature that the shipped in was, uh, so when you see Kubernetes resources, uh, you have a status field and in, inside the status field, there's a thing called conditions. Now the schema of conditions has been uh, like a bit, it, it varies a lot uh, depending on the resource. Now with this release, uh, there's a feature shipped which actually specifies some guidelines or a default thing that you can use, uh, any API you can use. So there's a condition type for uh, conditions in status objects that uh, the API designers can use, and then they can also like derive uh, more uh, features out of them, more uh, attributes out of them. Uh, this is uh, graduating is stable. So it is available in 1.19 by default. And the next feature in the API machinery SIG is warning mechanism for deprecated APIs. So Kubernetes follows like a graduation mechanism for uh, APIs. And then you go from alpha, then beta to like stable releases, even in cases of uh, REST APIs. So what you see here is the ingress API. So ingress API resides in two different API groups. Uh, so one is like uh, one version is like v1 beta one the next is the stable one so what do you see here is if you try to access the v1 beta one resource uh, ingress resource you will get a deprecation warning that hey uh, this resource will be phased out in 1.12 can you please use the uh, newer one as you see here uh, it when you use uh, networking.kts.io slash v1 beta one slash ingress it actually prompts you that, hey, use uh, the stable one, uh, networking.kts.io slash v1 ingress. Uh, we have a beautiful feature block on this. You can, uh, so when we post the slides, you can just click on the slide uh, where we wrote feature block and then see the blog on, our, on the Kubernetes website. Moving on, uh, the next SIG in focus is SIG architecture. So the first thing there is uh, clarify use of node role labels uh, within Kubernetes and uh, it also attempts to migrate the components which actually use the node role labels. So traditionally there has been a uh, label called node role.kubernetes.io slash something. And it was seen that uh, several components even inside the Kubernetes architecture use that to change behavior. But the purpose of the label was to give a API. Uh, I should not tell it as an API, but as a resource for other people or an attribute for consumers of Kubernetes to actually modify uh, behaviors or migrate, like do, do stuff around it. So in this Kubernetes release, uh, it, it's a beta, re it's a beta uh, rollout. Uh, so along with clarifying the usage of the label, there has been 
like identification of who consumes all those labels and an attempt has been started to actually migrate them out of that behavior. Now, uh, the next feature of uh, SIG architecture that we rolled out was uh, enabling running the conformance tests without beta REST APIs or features. Uh, so this is, this does not usually conform to our alpha beta stable thing because it's like internal APIs and then uh, so this is kind of a stage stage thing so the conformance tests can uh, so what happens is if you see kubernetes projects uh, or projects outside the kubernetes ecosystem who actually use kubernetes as a uh, resource or a product so they need a stable and reliable foundation for actually using kubernetes now in order to achieve that uh, when you run Kubernetes conformance tests, which actually verifies whether a distribution is uh, conformant to the spec or not, uh, you uh, now don't need to run the beta features. Like the tests are not run using beta features. The next uh, feature is very important in a sense. It is kind of related to the deprecation warning. So there have been instances in the past where certain Kubernetes resources like, let's say, uh, run jobs or ingresses or uh, pod disruption budgets, uh, uh, policies, basically, pod disruption budget policies, they have stuck in beta for a long time. Now, it's like a double-edged sword. So in one sense, when people ship it to beta, they get enabled by default in the Kubernetes distributions. But if you see uh, it like that, there is little incentive to actually make it to uh, GA. But then this may lead to instabilities or user friction. So with this release, it, it has been mandated as a policy that along with any new beta features that are coming in in 1.19, any old beta features that were there have to reach GA and deprecate the beta or have a new beta version. For example, they can go from V1 beta 1 to V1 beta 2, or they have to go to V1. Uh, there has been like some resources that have been already uh, transitioned in 1.19, like ingress, uh, which was beta, I think, uh, in like uh, a few releases, like a lot releases back. I'll come to that later on when I give the SIG network updates. Uh, with that, I'll hand over again to Taylor uh, for more updates on the SIG front. Thank you very much, Navarin. Uh, <laughs> we need we needed a baton to keep passing back and forth. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm so glad that these authentication uh, callouts will no longer be a secret. <laughs> um, so looking at the uh, the first one in authentication is the uh, Kubelet client TLS certificate rotation. Uh, and so what that is is so before with the Kubelet client there was an out of cluster system that was set up to kind of handle that rotation. And, uh, and while that was done automatically, uh, it was not you know, as efficient as it could be and it didn't operate within the cluster. Thus, you know, kind of, um, even though it was secure, we get even more security by having this happen within the cluster. Um, so now this, this feature has moved to stable and uh, as that expiration date comes up, this automatically gets rotated out. Uh, and then you'll notice with each of these slides, we have stable tracking issue and enhancement proposal. So as these slides get distributed, uh, you can click on those and kind of introspect um, these in, in a little bit more detail if you want. Uh, so the next one is limit node access to API. Um, so this is a security conscious enhancement in that uh, previously nodes were able to set labels and some of those could be done within the Kubernetes namespace, Kate's IO and Kubernetes IO. Uh, that now is protected and no longer the case. Uh, this has been moved to stable and uh, just overall makes your workloads a little bit more secure. You can operate with a little bit more confidence of things not changing that on your actual nodes. Certificate signing request API. So this one is that um, the certificates API would handle the root uh, certificate authority used to encrypt traffic between a lot of the core components within Kubernetes. And uh, this now adds a registration authority such that the signing process uh, is a little bit more secure 
and uh, you now have that uh, endpoint able to be called if you want to include this in any of your machine, uh, your operators or machinery within uh, core Kubernetes. Uh, with that, I'm going to, oh, uh, cluster life cycles is, uh, is mine as well. Um, cluster life cycle. So the first new feature that we have here is new cube ADM component config scheme. So the, uh, the cube ADM component is that configuration management is getting a huge refresh. Um, some of those changes include the, uh, the stop defaulting component configs and uh, delegating that config validation. This is a new feature. Again, you know, cube ADM is getting a lot of work done uh, to it in the uh, releases to come. And I'm quite excited about that in terms of a little bit more granular configuration and uh, hitting on some of the things that we've seen problems with or, or you know, rough edges in the community. Uh, the next one is customization with patches. So this one I also found quite interesting in that uh, new flag experimental patches has been added, very similar to the cube control um, uh, type of declaration. And uh, so if you want to set different values for dev, test, prod, other environments, uh, you can do so. Once this moves out of alpha and into beta, that flag then becomes dash dash patches. And with that, I would like to hand it back over to Navarun to talk about instrumentation. Thank you, David. Uh, so with, uh, with instrumentation special interest group, we have a beautiful thing called uh, events. So if you see uh, Kubernetes, uh, there are a lot of resources or components which generate events. But one thing that people need to ensure or workloads need to ensure that the rate at which they churn out events, that should not have impact on the other part of the cluster, other parts of the cluster. And Users should also be able to track uh, what changes are happening. Uh, it can be related to verbosity of the events, or let's say some event, uh, like let's say I want to find out an event by which component of the cluster actually generated that event, or which controller generated that event. Now with this release, uh, a redesign happened uh, of the event API. Uh, you can go ahead and read the enhancement proposal. It has a lot of details on how the structure has changed. And there is one more really good uh, enhancement coming up next, which also deals on similar lines, which is structured logging. So as Taylor uh, spoke about it earlier when giving the highlights. Uh, so if you see Kubernetes uh, logs in like controllers or uh, any other component, you will see that they were traditionally like uh, strings. So now there is a backward compatible change in 1.19. It's also in alpha, by the way. So if you want to use uh, structured logging, you have to enable the feature flag, which uh, enables structured logging. Uh, so what this does is you have an additional function called info s uh, in klog, uh, where you can basically specify object key value pairs, and which will basically parse out the references later on when uh, you see the logs. So as you see, we uh, have added an example. So if you do a klog.info s, uh, pod status updated, get, say that, hey, the key is pod and the object is this, object pod, and then again, uh, status is equal to status. And then it comes out beautifully into the logs. Also, one more thing is you can actually see all the changes in the JSON format. What you need to do is basically pass a flag called logging format is equal to JSON which will also churn out these logs in the JSON format, wherever applicable, whenever you did using InfoS or errors. Uh, what this enables the end user to do is you can basically ship out the logs to any log churning or log warehouse, and then basically filter those or index those logs based on the keys, which makes uh, debugging a lot easier. Uh, how to, like, you want to see uh, what happened at a certain point of time. Moving ahead, uh, we next have network, uh, SIG network related announcements. The first thing is SCTP support for services, pods, endpoints, and network policies. So it was added as, as an alpha, uh, I think last release or few releases back, and it graduated to beta. Uh, so this feature is now available without, uh, like the feature gate is enabled by default. Uh, 
so that you don't need to make any changes when bootstrapping the cluster so as to uh, take like use SCTP protocol ports. So if you see, uh, I put a screenshot of a service uh, resource where you say that, hey, uh, talk to my app, but then the protocol is SCTP. So this is very useful in the telecommunications world where they use SCTP a lot for switching. Uh, and one interesting thing is this feature is also slated to go to GA in this release, the current 1.20 release, which is like a great win. Uh, moving ahead, uh, we have the endpoint slice API. So this is uh, a very substantial change. Uh, so what traditionally happens is every service resource has uh, a way to track pods to which it has to uh, direct the traffic coming into the service. It used to do using something called uh, endpoints objects. So you can think of endpoints, endpoint objects as basically arrays of references to pods to give a very uh, thousand feet view into it. What happens is, uh, let's say if you have like a thousand pods, which are pointed to by the same service, what happens is when you want to update that uh, reference to the object, it becomes a bulky data transfer across the network. You have to send like around a megabyte of uh, endpoint uh, blob that you need to modify and then patch back to the resource. Now, uh, instead of endpoints, what you can use is something called endpoint slice. So it basically chunks out endpoints into slices, as simple as that. It is enabled in QProxy by default with this release. And there's a beautiful blog uh, on the website again, which shows you a scenario, uh, a real life scenario, which actually explains why this was needed. I would urge everyone to actually go ahead and uh, read it. Uh, obviously, you can also go to the enhancement proposal to see uh, the intricate details of the same. Going ahead, uh, we have graduated ingress to v1. As I was saying earlier, that ingress was uh, in beta since Kubernetes. I think it was alpha in 1.1 and then around 2015-ish, uh, fall 2015-ish. Since then, it was in beta. But then with this release, it has reached GA. Uh, a very important change here is that uh, earlier you, in backends, you needed to put service name and service port as uh, keys, uh, like uh, attributes of the structure. Now, uh, it, they have been like uh, shelled out into a service structure and then inside that you have name and port attributes. Uh, it more or less remains the same, just that it's like better. Uh, going ahead, so adding app protocol to services and endpoints. Uh, so this is a feature which uh, I think uh, did alpha a few releases back and then uh, I think in uh, 1.17 uh, it was added to end, end, uh, service port and endpoint ports as beta and now this has also been added to services and endpoints. So now you don't need to uh, basically have those uh, arbitrary uh, resource annotations. Uh, let's say uh, you have some controller which actually sees those labels and then acts upon them. Uh, now you have something called app protocol which actually makes things much easier for you. Uh, so there have been instances where users have reported that it actually creates incoherencies. There's an issue linked, uh, I linked an issue like uh, the link uh, called user, where I hyperlinked user frustration to. Uh, you can go ahead and see uh, it's an issue on Kubernetes slash Kubernetes, the main code base repo. Uh, going forward, uh, we have uh, SIG node updates. With that, I'll hand over back to Taylor for something. Thank you, Navarin. So uh, quite a few uh, SIG node enhancements. Uh, the first one of which is SecComp, which has a lot of people. Um, I've seen a lot of demos on this actually, and uh, and worked with uh, David Rakod uh, about on one of these on a uh, on a, a different stream as well. And what this does is it provides you the ability to set a SecComp profile for a pod using the pod security policies. Uh, it also allows uh, for that control of privilege given to pods, so you can uh, again you know put a SecComp profile onto that pod and include that in. Um, and you could either you know, define one via the, the local runtime or you can set your own and configure that. 
Um, I wish you all uh, lots of luck in configuring sec comp profiles. Uh, that's uh, something I usually do, but uh, typically in my nightmares, but uh, <laughs> very, very, very critical and uh, uh, something that you should do, but uh, uh, it is no, it is a quite, quite an effort. Uh, moving on to node topology manager. So for this feature that has moved into beta, um, the use case is um, teams that have to, you know, spin up a lot of compute and have a low latency uh, uh, kind of response time. They need that low level of latency and they prefer just one core on the CPU. They don't want to break it up across those multiple cores and kind of risk that, uh, that overhead in that time. So this is really just giving more control about how to burst out and work within those clusters, uh, thus providing get preferred allocation and get pod level topology hints. Uh, the next one is building Kubelet without Docker, and that's exactly what it does. Uh, really just about removing that dependency on the Docker, Docker uh, Golang package, and then allowing Kubelet to compile and work without that Docker dependency. However, that doesn't mean that it's uh, that this feature is not focused on that removal of code uh, in tree at the current point in time. Next one uh, is allow users to set a pods hosting to its FQDN. We talked about this a little bit in the highlights and really said so this is very much to help out with interoperability with legacy systems and very easy to set uh, for your pods, just host name FQDN, true. Uh, oh, those are my favorite types of features are the ones that are a little bit easier to enable than not. Moving on uh, to the Kubelet feature, uh, disable accelerator usage metrics. What this is really is uh, so the with the third party device monitoring plugins a separate issue and pod resources API about to enter GA. Um, it's not expected for the Kubelet to gather metrics anymore. So really this enhancement is just about that deprecation around Kubelet collecting those accelerator metrics. And with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Nabaroon to close this out on these uh, SIG enhancements. And uh, with that, you're up, Nabaroon. Thanks, Taylor. Uh... I am assuring you I won't switch back to you again, uh, <laughs> the updates. Uh, so with scheduling, we have, uh, I think, five uh, features that they shipped, that they have shipped. Uh, the first of them is graduating the cube scheduler component config to v1 beta 1. Um, to give you a small context on what component config is, so as you saw in the cube idiom updates too, so Using component config, so the idea of behind component configs is how, like what if you can configure the Kubernetes components themselves with Kubernetes resource manifest kind of things. Uh, so it has been, th this effort is, has been going on since uh, the past year, I guess, uh, under the cluster lifecycle uh, WG component standard. Uh, so here uh, in this specific enhancement, they were focusing on cube scheduler. Uh, I have put in a small snippet, a very basic snippet of how a component config looks for cube scheduler. So this went on beta uh, in 1.19 and the cap owner uh, wants to soak it for at least two releases and hopefully it will go uh, GA in 1.21 or eventually soon. Next up is run multiple scheduling profiles. Um, so this is a very interesting uh, announcement, I would say, like from a personal point of view, like we, like we face a lot of uh, problems when uh, scheduling workloads in uh, a Kubernetes cluster. The, the problem comes up when like you have heterogeneous workloads. Uh, let's say you have like long running jobs. Let's say you have batch workloads, which you can't really interrupt. Uh, if you, if they're not interruptible, uh, what if, you have, so you have like uh, jobs which are very ephemeral, like web servers, you can, they, which don't store state, you can basically kill them. Now, you can, you could also solve this problem using multiple schedulers, but there's a big issue with that is race conditions and scalability concerns. So what multiple scheduling profiles does is it actually introduces profiles in the, in a single scheduler. So you can have different algorithms for different kinds of workloads. Uh, 
uh, it went alpha last release, uh, uh, sorry, in 1.18 and in 1.19 it graduated to beta and is eventually stated for GA in 1.21. Moving ahead, uh, even part spreading across failure domains. So if you see, uh, there's a feature called, uh, so you can basically set up uh, affinities or anti-affinities or you can basically kind of to a certain extent uh, model your workloads, uh, uh, what do you say, spreading criteria across a cluster. Let's say you have like uh, a web server running that and you don't want them to run on the same node. You can say that, hey, uh, please don't run on the same node. You can say that no two pods should run on the same node. They will get spread over in your cluster as much as possible owing to other restrictions like uh, if you have like more replicas than there, there are nodes, obviously this can't be satisfied. Uh, coming back, uh, so there's a feature which added like more controls at the end of the end user to give uh, scheduling heuristics like this and also achieve high avail availability and resource utilization. Uh, with that said, uh, there is a very important thing we should uh, see here is that you actually have an option to say that, hey, this heuristic is a hard requirement or a soft requirement. Basically, you can differentiate between a predicate or a priority. Uh, based on that, whatever you set, uh, whatever you configure your uh, scheduler to or your workload to, uh, your workloads will get scheduled in that manner. And it went stable, this release cycle. So it is here to stay. Uh, going ahead, so add, adding a configurable default constraint to pod topology spread. So this is kind of related to the previous feature, which went GA, this release, but this was added as a new feature uh, in this release. So what can happen sometimes is in your pod specification, uh, if you have like many different, like let's say thousands of workloads, thousands of different kinds of workloads, it may be tedious to go ahead and specify topology spread constraints for each uh, resource. What this enhancement does is it allows you to set a default spreading constraint. After that, you don't actually need to like set on everyone unless and until you want to override the default. This went alpha in this release uh, and hopefully it will go to beta in the next, I think this release or next release. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, those scheduling features. They're like really uh, boon. Uh, so coming, coming to the next feature, adding non preempting option to priority classes. So priority classes uh, have been a GA feature since I think 1.14, uh, which impacts the scheduling and eviction of pods. So what happens is uh, if you, so if any pod has, uh, so pods are actually scheduled in descending priority. So lower priority pods are preempted or killed if there is a high higher priority pod coming in and there are resource uh, exhaustions in your cluster. Now, this uh, enhancement actually adds a non preemptive option. You can say that, hey, uh, this priority class can like, it may or may not trigger preemption as in like you can disable the preemption feature. So what this will do is it adds a default, it's as an attribute called uh, uh, I think it's called, uh, sorry, uh, I, so this is written in the announcement proposal. You can go ahead uh, and see the cap where it is written, but the default value right now is false. So it will still follow the previous behavior of preemption, but then if you want, you can go ahead and enable uh, like non preemption. So you can say that, Hey, don't preempt parts. Going ahead uh, to the next thing, storage. Uh, so storage also has a lot of updates coming in into this cycle. Uh, the first of which is immutable secrets and config maps. Uh, this went alpha last release and in this release, uh, it just graduated to beta, uh, which implies that you can use this feature without any switching of feature flag. Now, uh, to give you a small context on what this does, it actually lets you like what happens is if you if 
you can see so the default behavior is you can if any secret or config map gets changed it directly gets watched by kubelet and then updated on the pod let's say you have like thousands of those objects now watching those objects becomes tedious job this actually tries to solve that problem uh, so going at so we have a few CSI driver migrations in this release, uh, to be exact two. Uh, first is Azure Disk entry to CSI driver migration. So if you are using Azure Disk uh, for storage in your cluster and you have the CSI driver installed, you can just uh, turn on the feature gate called CSI migration Azure Disk to basically use the out of tree code. Same case for vSphere. So you have the uh, feature flag called CSI migration vSphere, which actually enables out of tree uh, code usage. Going ahead, uh, so we have two again kind of related uh, enhancements. So one is storage capacity tracking. So what happens is uh, often the Kubernetes scheduler has literally no information about whether a CSI driver can create a volume in a specific node. This feature, what it does is it gives a attribute called storage capacity, which is seen by the controller and then determines whether you can schedule the pod or not. There's a feature block again on it, uh, which describes this very feature. This is alpha right now. So you have to enable the feature flag so as to use this feature. Uh, next up is generic ephemeral inline volumes. It is also kind of related to the previous one and it gives you a beautiful way where you can extend Kubernetes with CSI drivers, but which provide lightweight and local volumes. So there's a new resource called ephemeral, ephemeral volume source, uh, which contains the fields that are needed to create the volume claim. Uh, and another thing if you see here is the pod which creates that resource gets as an owner of the resource. So if you delete the pod, the resource gets deleted automatically. There's a uh, default garbage collector scheme used in Kubernetes. Uh, again, reiterating, all the alpha features need to be enabled explicitly uh, with the feature flag. Uh, so the last uh, enhancement in uh, storage is allowing CSI drivers to opt into volume ownership change. Um, so to give you a short background, what happens is if you specify FS group in your pod security context in a pod, any volume that you mount gets masked with that FS group. Now, this is really not necessary that the uh, bare like backend, the CSI, the CSI type that you're using supports uh, ownership modifications using FS group. For example, NFS it does not support. So you now get a feature called uh, supports FS group when, where you can say, when, where the CSI driver can say that, hey, I support sub FS group or not. Based on that, your FS group should be uh, like honored or not, the, the one that you said in the pod. Uh, this is again an alpha feature, has to be enabled uh, so as to use it. Going ahead, uh, so it's the last thing in the roster for us, uh, Windows. So we have a sole enhancement in Windows, which is supporting CS, uh, CRI container D on Windows. What it tries to do is basically improve the metrics of Kubernetes features that you can use on Windows by going through the uh, container D spec. So users can now choose to run only C container D CRI instead of Docker Enterprise. Now this change going to stable gives a path to, uh, to the like implementers to actually implement Kubernetes specific features that are not available on the Docker API, which are available just on the container D API. And with that, uh, that's all on the announcements. And I will hand it back to Taylor to talk a bit about the release team shadow program. Hey, so release team shadows. Uh, with each new Kubernetes release, there is a new Kubernetes release team that is comprised of Kubernetes members who handle the day-to-day -day logistics of the release itself. Uh, the team is broken down into seven different roles. 
Um, so uh, for those interested, uh, I definitely recommend checking out the uh, Kubernetes SIG release uh, repository. Inside of there are role books, and it talks about each of those different roles. Um, you know, we could see them here, it, depending on what you might have an interest in. So personally, uh, I, I started in similar shoes to Max and worked through the uh, communications roles. Um, and then uh, in the Kubernetes 116 release was the communications lead, took 117 off, came back in 118 as a uh, release lead shadow, and then led the 119 release. So um, the program is really fantastic in that you uh, just show up and you learn and you gain a lot of, of information from being part of the shadow program. Um, you aren't expected, you know, for those of you nervous about uh, having the world see your contributions, whether it be code, documentation, or, or what have you, um, no worries. The Kubernetes community is really fun, friendly, and engaging. And uh, just, you know, if you have questions, that's the best place to ask them. Um, the, the, again, the team is fantastic and, and very easy to work with. And um, as you read through role books, if you're interested, um, you can kind of see what might be a good fit for you or something you might want to learn. Might be something you don't do in your nine to five job or just something you have an innate curiosity about. Um, and then uh, we walk you through that shadow program and then kind of try to get everyone set up to uh, potentially be a lead in some capacity. Um, so again, the goal is to train new leads uh, to when leads aren't able to make it, um, you know, they have a conflict, you know, life event happens, something uh, stuck at the stuck at the uh, uh, motor vehicle, you know, uh, place, then, uh, you know, the, we typically would call on shadows to, to help out with that. Um, I leaned very heavily on uh, uh, Jeremy and Bob. Those are my release lead shadows. Um, uh, I went through a job transition, so that just yet another example of a, a life event coming up, and, and Bob and Jeremy were always just really keen to help out, and I uh, really appreciate that from both of them. Uh, for each role, there's one lead, and typically three to four shadows um, that are selected via the shadow application process. Uh, the application typically gets advertised near the end of a release or just before uh, a release starts. And typically, you'll see that shared out on LinkedIn, Twitter, um, and, and several other uh, venues and, and avenues. The release cycles generally last around three months, but uh, with uh, 119 being a prime example, we went quite a, quite a bit beyond that. Um, weekly workloads ebb and flow, uh, as some teams are a little bit more busy than others. So like uh, enhancements, uh, uh, Nabarun and, and Max, I'm sure can, you know, at, at, after this, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, but I'm sure you can attest to this, where enhancements was very busy during the beginning of the release cycle, and communications was very busy near the end of the cycle, as an example. Um, so uh, that is also covered in the role books, uh, just, and, you know, with the weekly breakdowns, gives you a really good understanding of, of what you're in for and what uh, time commitment you can, uh, you know, if you're willing to make that put into the shadow process. Uh, for more information, please click on the release team shadows GitHub repo link here uh, once, once those slides are all shared out. So with that, I'd like to turn it, uh, I'd like to open up for questions uh, and turn it back to Max and Abra and if, if you wanted to say anything about the shadow program or, or your experiences on that front too while we're waiting for questions to come in. <laughs> Join us. It's I, a great I would... <laughs> Yeah, I, I would like to say a few words about the program. Like, it's a great program. I would say anyone uh, looking at, like, m many people ask me, like, how to get started contributing to Kubernetes. But then uh, this is, there, there is this beautiful program, right? Uh, release Team Shadow Program. You can just come in and say, uh, like, hey, I am interested in working in this vertical. This really interests me. Uh, can I work? Uh, and, and then you get to meet. So, like so many awesome people who actually help you get started and then grow into the community. So I started nearly one year back with the Kubernetes 1.17 as an enhancement shadow. Uh, then I shadowed again in 1.18 because I really liked the role. Then I uh, led the 1.18 enhancements. Then again, uh, I am shadowing the release lead this cycle. Uh, so this, this is really fun. Uh, like, uh, and, and you get to feel uh, the responsibility that is bestowed upon you that, hey, you, you have some important role in the community. You are looking after these. And the team is uh, like filled with diverse folks from the community. Like uh, there is like huge time zone diversity. Like, uh, like 
like Taylor and uh, Max can also say like right now in this call we are like 12 and a half hours span in time zone me from IST uh, Max is from Central European time and then uh, Taylor is from Pacific time uh, US Pacific coast now so if you see like there are literally no barriers other than you just going ahead and applying to the program even if you are not applying to the program just go ahead and just come to the Slack channel and say, hi, I want to work on this. Nobody would say no. <laughs> Literally nobody would say no. Okay. I assure you that. Absolutely. And it's really great to see how all the, the massive contribution from this really huge, fantastic community um, all get brought together in this steps, step by step. Um, you see more and more getting this version and its quality and then it's getting ready for the release and then everyone's sitting there and it's getting nervous and then you see like the countdown and then in the last moment someone writing now we are going to release it and then you see like what's all going behind the scene it's it, it's really great to see this um gary how much time do we have left to to potentially go into some of the questions um yeah. we have right now no open one but we can at least highlight one or two of the questions which we answered already we have about four minutes left. Okay, that sounds like we, we at least can have a look at the one or two things which we got so far. Um, so one question which I really liked is about that, um, it's also about actually the um, um, endpoint slices um, was a question that there are some issues with the daemon sets and a really huge cluster and the update cycle of the daemon sets. Um, so the answer to this is, yes, with the endpoint slices, this problem is also going to be solved in future. Um, there's a really great blog post about it from Rob Scott, um, who um, drafted this and, and worked mainly on it. Um, and why it is so, every of the communication within Kubernetes goes through the Kubernetes API server, and not just something which comes from the outer world, but literally every communication. And that's why the huge your cluster is getting um, the, well, not slowlier, but sometimes a little bit uh, inconsistent performance you will find um, through the API server. And this is exactly what the um, endpoint slices will solve in the future. So if it's growing, um, then you have smaller chunks and the update cycles shouldn't be that much infected from it. Um, then there was another question in the beginning, actually, about the um, alpha and beta features, which end up in the CKA and CKAD. So officially, we cannot give the, the best answer to it because we do not uh, write down the curriculum and what should be included, what shouldn't be included. But that actually um, answered perfectly. Ingress is a really specific baby because it's so old. I mean, it's actually, it's like, it, it should go already in the retirement action uh, section. Um, but no, it's it's a stable thing, even though it was so long time and better. Now it has become officially stable. Um, so that's why there end up some alpha and beta features. Normally shouldn't happen. Except we find something else which is super duper old and stuck in, in a beta or alpha version. Um, also really interesting is about the kubectl um, and the client rotation. Um, so with a certificate client rotation, um, if implemented or if configured, it will does this by its own. Yes, you can force it also if needed, um, but actually Kubernetes takes care about it. Um, and then maybe the last comment, this release is cool, thank you. Um, it's matching with our mandate of resilience. Um, thank you very much for this comment. Um, as said, it's mainly about the contributors out there who spend their most of the time free time for contributing to the Kubernetes release. Um, giving their heart and blood and sometimes sweat, even in these difficult times, um, to to the community, um, keep contributing and support this really great open source project. Okay. Thank you all very much for a wonderful presentation. That's just about all the time we have for today. Um, we'll get to the court, the presentation here in the slides will be available later today on the CNC webinar page. I would like to thank everyone again for joining us today. Have a wonderful and safe weekend, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank see you. Around, see you around bye the bye. cluster. See you around the cluster. <laughs> <laughs>
Provided there are no DNS outages. <laughs> <laughs>